I was uh, extremely emotional, obviously, because of the decision that I had made. <clears throat> I was emotional because of the fact that I felt that I came very close uh, to making a bad decision, one that would affect literally hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I came very close to uh, showing the prejudice uh, that I obviously had uh, to my daughter, uh, to my staff, and to the community in San Diego. Um, and I think that what hit me uh, when I started reflecting that night uh, was that I had been prejudiced, and I was showing that prejudice in the position to veto that. Uh, I was saying that one group of people did not deserve the same dignity and respect, uh, did not deserve uh, the same uh, symbolism uh, about marriage, and I was saying, in effect, uh, that uh, their marriages were less than, were less important uh, than the marriages to heterosexual couples. So all of those things came into it. Uh, <clears throat> your daughter Lisa talk you into signing the resolution? No, quite to the contrary. <clears throat> what do you mean by that? Uh, Lisa worked on my campaign. Uh, Lisa um, was with me every step of the way along with my wife and my other daughter. Uh, Lisa felt that um, the position on civil unions um, was one that she understood, um, was one that she thought the community understood, and was one that was probably politically palatable uh, to the base of support that I had. Uh, and she felt that it was important that I be reelected because I was a good mayor in her estimation, uh, and that uh, that uh, was acceptable under those circumstances. What convinced you to sign the resolution? Well, I, <clears throat> as I said in this uh, in the video, I struggled with this from the time I took the position on uh, civil unions. Uh, the night before uh, this press conference, though. Uh, I invited a group of uh, individuals from the gay lesbian community, uh, some of them neighbors, uh, some of them friends, some of them acquaintances, uh, and I wanted to give them um, the courtesy of telling them that I intended to veto the resolution. And what did those individuals share with you? Well, I, you know, I suppose what I expected uh, was that they'd say civil unions are fine. Um, I, I guess I was absolutely shocked at the depth uh, of the hurt, uh, the depth of the feeling, uh, the depth of the comments that came from them. Um, I remember uh, one of our neighbors, uh, who I've known for uh, quite some time, uh, said basically, uh, I walk by here, my partner and I are, walk by here all the time with our children. Uh, and you always stop when you're doing yard work and say hello to them and talk to them and um, you, you know, we're a family just like you're a family. Uh, one of our other neighbors uh, said that uh, she had children just like I did. Uh, they loved the children just as much and that they felt uh, their children deserved parents also and they deserved to have parents who were married. Uh, the depth of the feeling was unbelievable, uh, the depth of the hurt. Uh, and also, um, I could see the harm that I had done by considering the veto. Did any of these individuals threaten you with any political repercussions? Uh, no, and this wasn't a night about politics. This was literally a night where they showed the depth uh, of their feelings and their hurt. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that created part of the emotion the next day uh, was I realized how close I had, came, I had come to really closing the door on things that were uh, unbelievably important to them uh, as a group of people. And as mayor, were there any other reasons why you decided to sign the resolution? I, I think it's in the interest of government. Um, I, and I go back uh, to being a police officer. Uh, I know how easy it is to discriminate against people when you hear discrimination or you hear slurs or you see unequal treatment by the leadership of a department. Uh, I felt very strongly that uh, it was important we treat everybody equally. Uh, in our community policing, um, planning. Uh, we went to every community in San Diego, uh, African American, Asian, Latino, uh, gay, lesbian, and told them we wanted to police them like they wanted to be policed, and we wanted them uh, to become part of that policing. Uh, I know that it's also difficult uh, if you're in a relationship and you can't talk about it at work. 
Uh, you can't tell people that you have a partner or you can't tell people that you're married and you have children if you're a gay or a lesbian. Uh, all of those things I think are important on the government side because if government tolerates discrimination against anyone for any reason, it becomes an excuse for the public to do exactly the same thing. And I think that as I look back on San Diego being a fairly conservative place, very different than San Francisco, um, discrimination took the form of violence against the, the gay community. Uh, and I don't think that's in government's interest for the community. I don't think it's in government's interest for governing itself. Now, you've testified that um, governmental discrimination could possibly foster uh, private discrimination. In your experience as a police officer, are hate crimes a form of private discrimination? Well, I think hate crimes are the most extreme form of discrimination. Uh, hate crimes are perpetrated on people solely because of their skin color, uh, their religious beliefs, or their sexual orientation. Uh, and that's frequently, a, a hate crime is frequently um, part of the violence. Uh, it's violence simply because that person is not like somebody else. Uh, and I think that when a city, when leadership talks in disparaging terms about people or denies um, the rights that everybody else have, the fundamental rights, then I think some people in the community feel empowered uh, to take action in hate crimes and in other ways. And um, during the time that you were police chief, uh, what was your experience with how the police department um, dealt with hate crimes in San Diego? Well, I think our department, like a lot of departments, didn't like to admit that there were hate crimes. Uh, we came a long way during that period of time where we created a hate crimes unit and where the district attorney did. Uh, but I have to tell you, in the early days, uh, there were a lot of hate crimes. Uh, there were gay bashings where young men would go out and get drunk and feel no, um, no problem at all with going out and, and, and bashing who they thought were gay people, whether they were or not. Um, I can remember uh, one circumstance where we had a series of robberies that culminated in the death of a young gay man simply because he was gay. Uh, I can remember in 2006 after the Pride Parade at the Pride Celebration, uh, an individual who decided that he could take it upon himself uh, to punish the entire community by bringing a baseball bat and literally beating uh, one man almost to death and beating several others. And that... Um, uh hate crime that you just referred to in 2006. That was during your term as mayor. Correct? Yes, it was. Um, mayor, at the beginning of your public career, were you as sensitive to the concerns of the gay and lesbian community as you are now? No, I wasn't. How were you different? Well, I, uh, I can't say that I was different from a lot of other people. I was a young cop in the early 70s. Uh, I participated in the slurs in uh, the locker room and the uh, lineups. Uh, I think what really uh, turned my opinion was when I saw uh, the sergeant, <coughs> excuse me, the sergeant uh, who admitted he was gay, was a good sergeant, was a good police officer, and then felt um, the, the discrimination from the rest of the department that literally drove them out. I, I felt that fundamentally that was not right. Um, throughout my career on the police department, um, it, it was not easy to come out of the closet for gay and lesbians. Uh, people we knew were gay and lesbian would not come out of the closet. Uh, they felt that their careers would be over. Uh, they felt uh, that they would be treated differently. Uh, my chief of staff uh, came to me when I became the chief of police and said, there's something I need to tell you. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to affect your decision on whether to have me or not, uh, but I'm a lesbian and I'm not going to come out of the closet because I don't think it's in my best interest because people will see me only as a lesbian and not as your chief of staff. So I think it was very tough for people in the police department as it was in the rest of society. Mayor, earlier you said that the reason that you, one of the reasons at least, that you were so emotional at the press conference is that you felt like you had been prejudiced. And I just have to ask you, how can someone who's been as committed to equality for all people be prejudiced against anyone? Uh, I guess that was really a defining moment for me. Uh, I had been uh, on the national conference for, at the time, Christians and Jews uh, for 10 years on the board of directors. Uh, later became the National uh, Conference for Community and Justice. I had been the uh, board chair for two years. I had participated in diversity workshops, diversity weeks uh, with high schools. I had gone through all these issues. 
I had participated in uh, two rounds of diversity training with the city, four-day workshops where we talked about all these issues, and yet the fact that I still believed that civil unions were equal to marriage, uh, I think really kind of shook me uh, because I think that the decisions I made on that were grounded in prejudice. Um, it didn't mean I hated gay people. It didn't mean I uh, didn't think the community was equal in every way. It simply meant that I hadn't understood the uh, issue clearly enough, and I was discriminated even against my own daughter by saying that her relationship was less than the relationship and marriage that my wife and I had. Is um, your daughter Lisa in a romantic relationship now? Um, yes. With whom? With uh, Megan. How long have you known Megan? I've known Megan for two or three years. And can you describe your relationship with her? Um, I love being with Megan. Um, she's like a third daughter. Um, she is great to be around. She's smart. She's resourceful. She's energetic. She's hardworking. Uh, she has been an excellent partner for my daughter. Um, and I uh, love being around both of them. Uh, but Megan is, is like another piece of the family and has been. Um, Lisa and Megan ever become domestic partners? They did. <clears throat> you know when that was? Uh, it was in July of 2009. And do you know if they had a ceremony to celebrate their domestic partnership? Uh, no, they didn't. They tell you beforehand that they were going to become domestic partners? No, I got a text from Lisa uh, one day saying that they had gotten the DP taken care of a couple days ago. <laughs> and I texted back saying, what in the world is a DP? Uh, and that's when I learned that they had gone down uh, to either the state or county, I'm still not sure, uh, to get a domestic partnership paperwork filled out so that they could uh, share benefits. So you didn't go with them to register as domestic partners? You know, I don't think that's really an exciting thing to do, uh, to go to a state or county building and watch someone fill out forms. Did Lisa and Megan send out announcements when they became domestic partners? No. Did anyone congratulate you on uh, the fact that they had become domestic partners? No. I ask you, as Lisa's father, do you believe domestic partnership is sufficient for her? No, I don't. Why not? Um, I believe my daughter uh, deserves the same uh, opportunity uh, to uh, have a wedding in front of family and friends and uh, co-workers. I believe she, has a, she should have the same opportunity to have that recognized uh, lawfully. Uh, I believe that uh, as a, a gay couple, they should have the same right as a heterosexual couple uh, in the marriage. I think we deserve, or she deserves to have that. Did Lisa and Megan ever get married? They did in uh, uh, December of 2009, about a month ago. Where did they get married? Uh, they got married in Vermont. Uh, they went back to visit Megan's uh, parents in uh, upstate New York, uh, and they felt strongly they wanted some marriage certificate from some government acknowledging that they were a married couple, and they went to Vermont. Uh, the two of them uh, went to the, uh, the county courthouse uh, in, a, in a city there. Uh, the uh, city clerk said, I'll have to find somebody to marry you, a justice of peace. Uh, he said, basically, we have a justice of peace who has a funeral in the afternoon, but I think she can do a wedding in the morning. Uh, and they went over to her house. Uh, she was prepared for the funeral but didn't have her shoes on, uh, and she married the two of them in her front room. Were you there? No, I wasn't. How did you learn of it? Uh, Lisa phoned me and told me that they had gotten married. And how did that make you feel? Um, it, it made me feel pretty bad that they had to go across the country uh, and be married in somebody's front room by somebody who was preparing to go do a funeral, be married without family and friends. Did anyone congratulate you on your daughter getting married? Uh, a lot of people have congratulated me. Uh, I believe Mr. Chandler um, congratulated me during the deposition. I appreciated Mr. Chandler's uh, congratulations. Has the marriage between Lisa and Megan harmed your marriage in any way? Um, yeah, I think that uh, what it has done is made my wife and I stronger. 
um, but it has not harmed our marriage. It's not harmed anybody in our family's marriage. Uh, I don't believe it's harmed anybody in the world. Uh, and I think Lisa and Megan have been an excellent example for us of persevering, of loving each other, and be willing to go to great lengths to show that. Mr. Mayor, during the course of the Proposition 8 um, campaign, <clears throat> Did you see any Yes on 8 campaign signs that made reference to protecting the children? Yes, I did. What did you see? Uh, I, I suppose what I saw was what everybody else saw, signs that uh, said Yes on 8 uh, and then showed little children, cutouts, uh, paper dolls. Um, I, I'm not sure what the symbolism was involved, but it, uh, that's what I saw. How did that make you feel? Well, I couldn't imagine why anyone would think um, uh, that children would be harmed by marriage. Um, I couldn't imagine how uh, Lisa and Megan uh, would, uh, could by any way harm anybody else. I couldn't imagine uh, why children would have to be protected from my daughter Lisa, who is one of the kindest and most compassionate people that I know. Um, so that was the feeling I had, was I have a loving uh, daughter kind, compassionate, and yet somehow uh, society has to be protect or so the children in society need to be protected from her. Are Lisa and Megan uh, planning to have children? I don't know. But I'd certainly like to be a grandfather. Nothing further, Your Honor. Very well. Cross-examine. Mr. Rom. Got a few binders to distribute. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Sanders. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Rahm. It's nice to meet you. Mr. Mayor, you spent the first 26 years, or, or you spent 26 years of your career in, uh, involved with the San Diego Police Department. Is that right? That's correct. And during that 26 years, uh, you saw a decrease in the amount of discrimination within the department against gays and lesbians. Would that be fair to say? It would be fair to say that we worked very hard on that issue, and uh, outwardly, I believe that's true. And in fact, you made specific efforts to improve the department's relationship with the gay and lesbian community. Yes, I did. And the San Diego Police Department's relationship with the gay and lesbian community improved over time. Yes, I believe it has. And currently, you, you would acknowledge that the San Diego Police Department is supportive of the gay and lesbian community? I would say that they're uh, fair in their treatment of the gay and lesbian community as we are with uh, treatment in every community in San Diego. Would you agree that in a broad sense, generally speaking, that the San Diego government uh, is more accepting of the gay and lesbian community today than it was in the past? Uh, I believe that it is more accepting, yes. And the city has specifically trained and worked with its employees to make sure that they convey respect uh, and dignity to the gay and lesbian community. Uh, we have worked to make sure that we have our employees uh, convey dignity and respect to every community in San Diego, whether it's the African American community, the Latino community, the Asian community, or the gay and lesbian community. And there, there are several open gay politicians in San Diego, is that fair to say? Uh, I would say that there are two on the city council, uh, one in the state senate. And um, Mr. I'm um, sorry, Ms. Kehoe, that she's in the state senate. She's our senator. Tony Atkins is on the city council. No, she's not. She was uh, on the previous council. In fact, she termed out, so that's why she's not on the council anymore. Right. What about Todd Gloria? Is that one of the other individuals that you were referring to on the city council? Todd Gloria is on the city council, yes. And Carl DeMaio? Carl DeMaio is on the city council also. 
two out of the eight current members, two of those members uh, identify as gay? Yes, they do. You would say, uh, as a whole, the city council is responsive to the, the needs of the gay and lesbian community. Right. I would say as a whole that uh, each city council member individually decides uh, issues that are important to that person in their community. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, tab one, which is your deposition <coughs> transcript. Dated January 5th, 2010. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And if you could turn to page 38. Yes, sir. Starting in line 22, you were asked question, as a whole, do you think that the council is responsive to the needs of the gay and lesbian, lesbian community? I do, along with every other community. Your answer was, I do. I do. Oh, uh, Bonnie DeManis? Yes. She serves as the... Uh, district attorney for San Diego? Yes, she is. And she identifies as a lesbian? Yes, she does. And you've indicated that you've met a couple of state uh, assembly members who also uh, identify as gay. Is that correct? That's correct. And would you agree with that activists for the gay and lesbian community have been effective in some of their political efforts in San Diego? Uh, I don't know that those came because of activism. Uh, I only know of one issue that's really come before us, and that's been the gay marriage issue. I'd like to draw your attention to page 41 of your deposition transcript. Starting with line six, question. You talked earlier about some community activists in the gay and lesbian community that you know. Would you describe their efforts as being effective within the San Diego community? And your answer was, you know, I suppose on certain issues they've been effective. Certainly on some issues they haven't been. Do you remember testifying to that? I do. And you would agree that on certain issues that certain activists have been effective in their efforts to support the gay and lesbian community? I'll go back to what I just said. Uh, there has only been one issue that's come before the council that was directly gay or lesbian related since I've been there, and that is this issue. I see. Well, what were you referring to in your deposition when you said that they've been effective on certain issues? Uh, I think that uh, they uh, represent a class of people, but I don't know of anybody. Um, I, I mean, we don't provide health and human services in the city of San Diego. Uh, we're not a county. Uh, we don't provide funding for um, those services. Uh, so when I was talking about this, um, we have seen activism in the community. Um, but really, issues don't come in front of the city of San Diego. They would go in front of the county of San Diego because they do the funding uh, for the HIV AIDS programs, for all these other programs. So were you referring to uh, activists being effective at the county level, is that what you're referring to? Well, I'm talking about overall. I don't know how effective they are at the county. Uh, that's not within my area, but um, I, I think that they have brought uh, forward issues, uh, or excuse me, on this issue. I know that they have brought forward issues at other um, levels on terms of health and human services. And you indicated that in some respect they've been effective, in other respects that they haven't been effective. That's what you testified to earlier. That's correct. correct. Okay. Just like any other political group, some issues they're effective and some well, issues I, they're not. We're not talking about politics here. We're talking about people who are trying to get health and human services. Well, I'm asking you specifically about your testimony. Well, and, and I, uh, I guess what, what I'm saying, saying is I'm not saying it's a political group. I see. So the, you're, you're referring to activists as a separate and apart from political groups. Uh, I believe you just said as a political group. I'm asking you what you think. Do you think that the activists that you referred to in your deposition on page 41 are separate and apart from political groups? I do. You would agree that most of the organizations that you've been involved with 
are generally supportive of the gay and lesbian community, correct? No, I wouldn't. You would not? No. I'd like to draw your attention to page 45 of your deposition transcript, starting at line 24. Question. The other organizations that you've been involved with, either working for or on the board, have any of them not been supportive of the gay and lesbian community? Answer. I don't know that some of them serve or don't serve. I believe most of them. If asked, they're generally supportive. You stated that in your deposition, did you not? I did. Mayor Sanders, for three years you served as the chief executive officer of and president of the United Way of San Diego, correct? That's correct. And during that time, the United Way contributed funds to nonprofit organizations that work with the gay and lesbian community, among other things? Uh, we provided funding for a wide variety of health and human services throughout San Diego County. Including services that uh, help the gay and lesbian community, correct? Including services that helped every community, including the gay and lesbian community. Thank you. And you participated in the campaign against Proposition 8, correct? Yes, I did. In fact, you went to a couple of fundraisers in support of No on 8? I did. And you went to a few rallies in support of No on 8? I did. In addition to yourself, there were other state and local politicians who campaigned against Proposition 8. Isn't that correct? Uh, I know of a couple. I don't know of how many. You also agree that there were particular religious leaders who campaigned against Proposition 8? Campaigned against Proposition 8? Yes. Uh, I don't know the names of those. I know there were a few religious leaders, uh, very few. Now, there was a time that you supported civil unions, as you previously testified, correct? That's correct. And that was your position when you were elected in 2005? That's correct. And uh, during that campaign in 2005, you made specific efforts to reach out to the gay and lesbian community, correct? Yes. For example, you appeared at the San Diego Gay Pride Parade? Yes, I did. In fact, you had done that um, approximately 10 times, correct? Yes. And uh, during the 2005 campaign, you participated in two debates at the San Diego Gay Bisexual Community Center? Yes. And after you were elected, you appointed three openly gay individuals to your personal staff? I did. That was Fred uh, Sains? Fred Sains. Jeff Gattis? Yes. And uh, George Biaghi? Yes. You also, in 2006, selected a openly gay um, fire chief, that Tracy Jarman, correct? I did. <clears throat> and uh, Ms. Jarman was unanimously approved by city council? Yes. And at that time, during 2005 and 2006, when you were mayor, uh, you respected the gay and lesbian community. I respected every community. Including the gay and lesbian community? Including the gay and lesbian community. And you seriously considered and attempted, at least, to address the needs of the gay and lesbian community? In what way are you talking about? Well, I'm asking. Did you, uh, during your uh, time as mayor, during 2005 and 2006, uh, attempt to address the needs of the gay and lesbian community? I attempted to address the needs of every community. I, I, we don't have a monolithic community. We have issues in every community, whether it's planning, uh, whether it's uh, housing, uh, whether it's uh, resources. Uh, I worked with every single community in San Diego to try to address their needs. And you were willing to consider the needs that were brought to you from the gay and lesbian community at that time, correct? I'm sorry. You were willing to address the needs that were brought to you by the gay and lesbian community at that time in 2005 and 2006? You know, I talk to individuals. Uh, I don't know that there's a gay-lesbian coalition. <clears throat> I met with individuals who might have been gay or lesbian uh, who brought forward issues, uh, but I was always willing to work on issues from any individuals who brought those in. I'd like to draw your attention to page 53 of your deposition transcript, starting in line 17. Do you see that? Are you there? <coughs> yes. yes. You were asked a question. So at that time, 
At the time that you were elected in 2005, did you consider yourself an ally of the gay and lesbian community? Answer, I considered myself to be someone who respected the community. Question, and were you willing to consider the needs they brought to you? Answer, yes. You made that, uh, you gave that testimony, did you not? I did. Now, during that time also, you had good friends from the gay and lesbian community, correct? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Sure, during uh, 2005 and 2006, you had good friends from the gay and lesbian community. I do. And in 2003, you had found out that your daughter Lisa identified as a lesbian. Yes, I did. And you weren't disappointed with that? No. As a father, I was happy that she found somebody uh, that she was uh, close to and had a relationship. I think that's the way fathers feel. You weren't upset in any way? Uh, I was upset only from the perspective uh, that I expressed earlier that I was concerned about how tough it is uh, to be a gay or a lesbian in a relationship uh, or to be open and out. You indicated that you were fine with it? I was absolutely, uh, I love my daughter very much and uh, I respect her as an individual, and I love her, and uh, whatever choice she makes is one that I would be willing to support. The fact is you were comfortable with it, and your primary concern was that she was happy, right? Right. But at the same time, during that period, you supported civil unions as a reasonable alternative to same-sex marriage, correct? I did. And you didn't think that was a position that was hostile to the gay and lesbian community, did you? No, I didn't. And your daughter Lisa understood your position, correct? Well, my daughter Lisa uh, said she understood it, yes. And despite the fact that you supported civil unions as a reasonable alter alternative to same-sex marriage, you don't believe that you communicated hatred to the gay and lesbian community, do you? I don't believe, I feel like my thoughts were grounded in prejudice, uh, but I don't believe I uh, felt hatred. I don't believe that I communicated hatred, um, but uh, uh, in retrospect, I do believe it was grounded in prejudice. Instead, you thought that civil unions <clears throat> were a fair and reasonable alternative to marriage, correct? At the time, yes. And you're uh, belief that civil unions were a reasonable and fair alternative to same-sex marriage, it wasn't based on any moral disapproval of gays and lesbians, right? No, as I said, it was based on, uh, um, it was grounded in prejudice from my perspective now. And uh, you indicated earlier that you thought that civil unions were a reasonable alternative because at that time, at least, you believed that they were equal to marriage. Yes. And you believe that... Uh, even today, people can distinguish between civil unions and same-sex marriage on reasonable grounds. They're not based in animus or ignorance. Uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean by animus. You'd have to help me with that. Well, what do you mean about by animus? Well, I consider animus overruled. Uh, I consider animus to be hatred uh, or bigotry. Okay. And you believe that reasonable people can disagree on the issue of civil unions versus same-sex marriage. And that disagreement is not necessarily based on animus or ignorance. Uh, I believe it's not based on, I can, it can be a situation where it's not based on animus. That doesn't mean that I don't believe it's grounded in prejudice. And you believe that prejudice is when you treat a class of people differently, correct? Yes. Now, you also believe that people voted in favor of Prop 8 because they, like you in 2005, viewed civil unions as a fair and reasonable alternative to marriage, correct? Uh, I don't believe that that's exactly what I said. Well, let's look at what you said in your deposition on page 68. starting in line four. Question. Okay. Do you think it's possible that that someone could I'm have... I'm sorry. Um, I'm not on the same. I've got... You said 58? No, page 68. Okay. Starting in line four. 
You were asked, okay, do you think it's possible that that someone could have voted in favor of Proposition 8 because they believed that civil unions were a fair alternative to marriage? You answered, I do believe some people did. Question, okay, let's step back for a minute. Do you, did you participate in any way in campaigning for or against Proposition 8? Answer, yes. In what way did you participate? I participate. I participated trying to make sure that Proposition 8 was defeated. Now, in your participation in opposing Prop 8, did you um, encounter people who believed that civil unions were a fair and reasonable alternative to same-sex marriage? I believe I probably encountered some, and I still believe that their feelings were grounded in prejudice. I don't believe that they realized what they were saying. I don't say that that makes them hate people. I don't think it makes them a bigot, but I think that uh, what they're saying is that an entire class of people do not deserve the same relationship as a heterosexual couple. But in 2005, you didn't hold that view, did you? Um, no, I didn't. I felt that civil unions were a reasonable alternative. And a big part of the base that you were relying on for your election in San Diego felt that civil unions were a reasonable alternative to same-sex marriage, correct? I believe so. Some of them did, at least. Well, you indicated that you thought a big part of the base believed that. I believe a, a large part of the base did, yes. You'd also agree that some people can be religiously opposed to same-sex marriage without having any hostility or animus towards gays and lesbians, correct? That is exactly right. They don't have to have animus or hostility. That doesn't mean that decision is not grounded in prejudice, though. And you would agree that there are people who have sincere religious beliefs on both sides of this debate, correct? I do. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, what's been marked as DIX 1475. It's at tab 3 in your binder. Did you find that? Yes, I did. And uh, do you recall having uh, been shown this particular document at your deposition? Uh, briefly, yes. Okay, and this, this document was written by um, uh, Mr. Blankenhorn. Do you recall that? Uh, I do. Now, and you read this at your de deposition. You were asked some questions about it. Correct? I was asked some questions. I don't know that I read it thoroughly. It was presented to me, and then I was asked questions. Okay. Now, I represent to you that Mr. Blankenhorn, who's the author of this article, argues that redefining marriage to include same-sex couples would undermine the purposes of ensuring that, in so far as possible, children will be raised by the man and woman whose sexual union brought them into the world. Do you recall um, that being the subject of this article? Uh, generally, yes. Do you agree that it's, uh, it's possible that people voted for Proposition 8 based on the reasons that are articulated in this particular article? Uh, I believe that uh, some people could say that. Uh, once again, I believe that their feelings would be grounded in prejudice and obviously misinformation. Because you disagree with the premise that's uh, put forward in this particular article. Well, it's not the premise. It's what we see in reality. Many, many children are not raised by biological parents. They're raised by one parent or another, or they are foster children. Um, so, I, I mean, this is supposing that everybody had a marriage uh, where both partners were there throughout the upbringing of their children, all through the children's life. Well, this article um, is for the idea that all things being equal, that the best case scenario for kids is to be raised with their biological mother and father. You disagree with that premise? Well, I, you know, I think all things equal, but I also was a cop for 26 years, and I know there are a lot of children who did not benefit uh, from child abuse, from child neglect by biological parents. So I don't know that we can say all things being equal. Okay, so you disagree with the premise that's being put forward by Mr. Blankenhorn? Uh, I do. Is DIX 1475 in? This is... Um, is it in evidence? Yes, it is, Your Honor. It was uh, admitted to evidence on Thursday in connection with uh, Dr. Cott. Very well. <clears throat> Professor Cott, I should say. Would you also agree that uh, some people who voted in favor of Proposition 8 did so 
simply to preserve the historical tradition of marriage in this country? I would believe that some people possibly voted that way. I don't really know. Uh, but once again, if they did, I would think that would be grounded in prejudice. And some people may have voted for Proposition 8 because they feel that marriage is tied to procreation. Would you agree with that? I would agree that some people could say that. I don't really know the reasoning behind that. And, and you agree that there are many reasons why people voted for and against Proposition 8? I do. And among these many reasons are reasons that are grounded in good faith beliefs in marriage between a man and a woman. I believe that good faith beliefs don't negate the fact that they're grounded in prejudice, which means that one group of people are being treated entirely differently simply because of their sexual orientation. Whether you have a grounded belief or not, I don't think negates that. And I understand that's your position. But... Uh, Nonetheless, you believe that certain people in good faith could disagree with that position that you just articulated? I believe that some people could, but I can't interpret what they do. In fact, you shared that sentiment at one time, did you not? Uh, I proposed civil unions as being a reasonable alternative, and I uh, admitted earlier that that was grounded in prejudice. But at the time that you believed it, you didn't think it was prejudice, did you? No, I didn't. Now, you're currently serving your second term as mayor of San Diego, right? Yes, I am. And you've been involved in at least uh, two political campaigns running for mayor. Yes, I have. And you've also been involved in, to some degree, in the Proposition 8 campaign? Uh, very peripherally. Well, you indicated that you spoke at, you attended rallies? Uh, I think attending a couple of rallies and going to a couple of fundraisers is peripherally. I wasn't an advisor. I didn't uh, participate in the campaign in that way. I see. I'd like to draw your attention to tab four. This has been marked as DIX 2618. It's an article dated October 14th from the San Francisco Chronicle entitled, A Lesson in Political Naivete. Do you recall seeing this particular article at your deposition? Yes, I do. Do you recall that this uh, article recounts an event where first grade students were taken out of their class and brought to a lesbian wedding during uh, school hours? Uh, I, as I recall, and I, I'm going to tell you, I read this very briefly when the question occurred at the deposition, uh, that the mayor conducted a wedding and a first grade class of the teacher um, also attended. And when you say the mayor, you're talking about uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom, correct? Yes. And you don't think that uh, this particular event, in other words, taking a class of first grade students to a same-sex wedding was a good public relations move for the No on 8 campaign, do you? I don't think the way it was portrayed was, no. Because you think it was portrayed as, in a way that didn't give the proper image to the sanctity of marriage, correct? Uh, that's correct. And uh, you would agree that this event could have hurt the No on 8 campaign it's in its efforts to oppose Proposition 8, correct? Uh, I think in the way that it was presented, it could have. Now, you testified earlier about your support of what's been referred to as hate crimes legislation. Yes. And at the time, you indicated that today, when you testified, you indicated that um, crimes that are committed because of someone's race and sexual orientation um, should be given additional punishment, correct? No, I didn't. And I didn't say that I, I'm sorry. I didn't say that I... Um, support hate crimes legislation. I said that I was opposed to the hate crimes and we worked very hard to um, to eliminate those. Oh, so you don't support hate crimes legislation? I certainly do, but I didn't say that earlier is oh. what I'm saying. Excuse me, excuse me. And you would also agree that uh, crimes should not be committed against individuals because of their religion, correct? You would. I'm sorry? I would. I'd like to uh, draw your attention to 
Exhibit DIX 1107 is a video that was produced by protectmarriage.com. Your Honor, this is uh, already in evidence. There we go. The mayor testified to the fact that he absolutely opposes any kind of violence against individuals because of their particular race or sexual orientation. He also agrees that uh, that would include um, crimes that are committed in connection with religion. And uh, I'd like to just show him this particular um, video because he's indicated that he's watched particular advertisements in connection with the Prop 8 campaign and has been upset by certain things that um, protectmarriage.com put out. And this is one of the things that protectmarriage.com um, put out, and we'd like to get his view on what's depicted in this particular video. This is a video that he's already seen? Yes. He has seen it? Yes, he's seen it in his deposition. I don't know if that's true, Your Honor. Well, let's well I'll represent to the court that he was played this in his deposition, and it's at uh, page 87, right. line 12. <clears throat> All right. It appears to have been played at the deposition. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Dear friends, Proposition 8 is about restoring the definition of traditional marriage, something millions of Californians support and have already voted for. Marriage between a man and a woman is hardly a controversial idea. Marriage involves a complex web of social, legal, and spiritual commitments. Excuse me, is this a video or just an audio? No, it's a video. It's just not coming up on the well, screen. Let's back it up and start it. Dear friends, Proposition 8 is about restoring the definition of traditional marriage, something millions of Californians support and have already voted for. Marriage between a man and a woman is hardly a controversial idea. Marriage involves a complex web of social, legal, and spiritual commitments that bind men and women for one overriding societal purpose, to create a loving environment for the raising up of children. Protecting the interests of children is the reason the state has for regulating marriage to begin with. For believing in traditional marriage, supporters of Proposition 8 have been excoriated, vilified, harassed, and abused. We have been called bigots. Untold tens of thousands of Yes on 8 signs have been destroyed or stolen by roaming bands of vandals and thieves. Signs not stolen or destroyed have been defaced. Supporters of Proposition 8 have had their property destroyed. Churches have been defaced. Donors to our campaign harassed and supporters beaten and hospitalized. We've persevered through all this abuse, standing up for what is right. And voters have responded. Every poll recently published shows Proposition 8 either leading or rapidly gaining momentum. The No on 8 campaign is getting increasingly desperate and shrill. Their most recent television commercial shows the contempt they have for supporters of traditional marriage. They call us intolerant and offensive. After all this, we're intolerant and offensive. Get mad, but don't lash out. Show your determination to pass Proposition 8. Volunteer to help on Election Day. Most of all, send a message on Tuesday. Vote yes on Proposition 8. I'm going to renew the objection on the ground. The only, I don't know what the relevance is, and uh, the witness only saw it at his deposition and at no other time. Objection <coughs> overruled. <clears throat> Mayor Sanders, you would agree that it's wrong for people to suffer violence as a result of their political views, would you not? I would. And in fact, you, um, you would think that. Uh, you do think that violent behavior against someone who disagrees with your political position is is um, not a political 
politically effective strategy, correct? Correct. And you don't think that vandalizing the property of someone who disagrees with your political position is an effective political strategy either, do you? That's my personal belief, yes. And you would advise people involved in a political campaign that they shouldn't steal campaign signs, right? On both sides. And you would have advised the people involved with the No on 8 campaign not to engage in any violent behavior or intimidation against their political opponents, correct? I didn't advise either campaign. Uh, that wasn't my question. But uh, you would have advised uh, the No on 8 campaign people not to engage any violent, in any violent or um, intimidation against, against the supporters of Prop 8, correct? I would, have, I would have advised both groups not to do that. And the reason that you would have advised against the use of violence or an intimidation in connection with a political campaign is because you don't think that those are effective political strategies, correct? Uh, I said personally that, but I am not a political scientist. Uh, I am not a political consultant. Uh, I know that you may consider me a politician after running twice. I consider myself a cop. Um, so I don't consider myself sophisticated enough to be able to tell what sells and what doesn't. I personally don't believe violence or um, stealing signs or any of that's uh, effective either way. But you ran two campaigns. I did. And you had political consultants in connection with those campaigns. And I hired them and paid them to make those type of political decisions. And, and you learned a little bit during those campaigns, wouldn't you say? I think I did. And you were successful in those campaigns. I was. ran for your re-election in 2008. Yes, I did. And at that time, you ran as a Republican. I did. And in 2008, you openly advocated against Proposition 8 and in favor of same-sex marriage. Is that correct? That's correct. During your re-election campaign, you again, uh, you again made specific efforts to reach out to the gay and lesbian community. I made specific efforts to reach out to every community in San Diego, yes. Right, but my question is you made specific efforts to reach out to the gay and lesbian community, including and among other communities. Yes. For instance, you spoke at the uh, Log Cabin Republicans convention, did you not? Yes, I did. And the Log Cabin Republicans is a national gay and lesbian Republican grassroots political organization. Correct? Um, I, yes, they are. I'm sorry. And uh, during your re-election campaign, you had the approval and endorsement of the of this national Republican group, correct? Well, I, I'm not sure that this didn't me speaking to them didn't come after the primary where I was elected. I can't find a date on this, to be very honest with you. I see. Now, you ran against five other candidates for mayor uh, in 2008. Yes, I did. That was during the primary? Yes. And during the primary, you received 54% of the total vote? I suppose approximately, yes. And because of that, uh, strong support that you received during the primary, you didn't have to run a general election, did you? Uh, San Diegans re-elected me in the primary. It would be fair to say that your support of same-sex marriage in 2008 didn't cause you to lose the election uh, as, as mayor. Uh, it didn't cause me to lose it. I can't say it made it easy. Now, your views on same-sex marriage have evolved substantially, haven't they, since yes, they 2005? Have. Yes, they have. At this point, you believe that the government should endorse and regulate same-sex marriage in the same way that it regulates marriage between a man and a woman? I, uh, I believe that the government should allow every group of people um, to be married in exactly the same way and enjoy the same rights and privileges and recognize the marriage in the same way. There was a point in your political career, however, that um, you didn't think government belonged in uh, the marriage business at all. You believed that marriage as an issue should be left up to the churches. Do you remember saying that? I do. And do you still believe that? No. 
When did you hold that view? Uh, I believe I held that view as part of my ignorance on the whole issue uh, when I first started out. And uh, you've been enlightened now, and you believe that the government should be in the marriage business, correct? I believe that the government should allow everybody to get married uh, in exactly the same way, not treating heterosexual couples different than treating gay and lesbian couples. If the government decided to get out of the marriage business, do you think that would be fair to all people? Uh, I don't believe that the government's going to get out of the marriage business. If the government said we are no longer going to sanction marriage in any way, and it's up to individuals to decide that, uh, then I suppose that would be fair to everybody involved. Thank you. Very well, redirect. Mayor Sanders, uh, Mr. Rahm made mention of you marching in a number of pride parades, correct? Yes. Did you march in, or have you marched in any other parades during your tenure as police chief or mayor? Uh, yes, I marched in the Martin Luther King Parade every year. I marched in uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, certainly have been in the parades uh, around Christmas in San Diego, the Fourth of July parades, the Veterans Day Parade. Uh, there are numerous parades that I'm part of every single year. And he also uh, uh, asked you uh, about two debates that apparently you attended at the center. Uh, can you give us some example of uh, other debates that you attended during the course of that 2005 election campaign? Well, during the 2005 election campaign, I believe there were close to 75 different debates throughout San Diego uh, in neighborhoods, uh, at television stations. Uh, it was a, a very debate-heavy uh, mayor's election. Mr. Mayor, have you, have you ever made a decision based on fear of political repercussions from the gay community? No, I haven't. Have you seen any other policymaker in San Diego make a decision or cast a vote based on fear of political repercussions from the gay community? No, and in fact, I think it's easier to, to go the other way, uh, especially in San Diego. It's easier to make a decision against the gay lesbian community than it is to make it for them. Why do you say that? Uh, because I, I think that uh, political ramifications are much stronger from the Republican Party and from others. How did the Republican Party react to uh, your decision to support marriage equality? Uh, they were very unhappy. And how did they express that displeasure? Well, they expressed the displeasure by, uh, I was a sitting Republican mayor. Uh, they expressed the displeasure by saying that they were considering withdrawing their endorsement. Uh, I had to go to uh, several party meetings uh, and talk to party members. Uh, I think that it was uh, a, a difficult issue. Uh, I think that uh, what I also saw in the kickoff of the campaign, a lot of people weren't there. That was the very next night uh, from the, uh, the press conference that I held. In your experience, has the Republican Party uh, in San Diego been responsive to the needs of the gay and lesbian community? Uh, I don't believe that's first and foremost in their minds. Why do you say that? Well, I think that their uh, national platform and their uh, local platform uh, has uh, said that marriage is between a man and a woman. Mr. Rahm made mention of the uh, log cabin Republicans. Are you aware of how large the log cabin chapter in San Diego is? Well, I spoke to him during one of the election cycles, and there were four members. Do the log cabin Republicans have any influence in the broader Republican Party in San Diego? No, I would say that they don't. Um, Mr. Rahm had you watch a video, DIX 1107. Do you have any reason to believe that what was represented in that video was true and actually happened? Well, I have absolutely no idea. I was just shown a video uh, that was produced by a campaign, uh, and then I, I suppose I'm supposed to believe everything that's in it. I don't have any grounding in that. I didn't hear those instances. I didn't see those instances. My wife and I do not watch television. We do not watch television news. We have not watched it for years. 
uh, and I didn't see any campaign ads on either side. When I said that I saw a campaign sign that portrayed little children, I'm talking about a bumper sticker or a sign. So I would have no idea if these things occurred or if they didn't occur on either side. Do you have any knowledge or experience with um, any no on Proposition 8 signs being vandalized? Well, I, uh, I have a personal experience where uh, somebody wrote on chalk in front of my house because we had a no, eight, no on 8 sign out that said, God's law, vote yes on 8. Uh, now, I don't believe we were the only household. Uh, I walk in the mornings uh, before people are out, and I saw those on other sidewalks where proposition, uh, no on 8 proposition signs were out. And this was in your neighborhood? Yes. I'd like to clear up one thing, though. I, I do watch the Charger and the Padre games periodically. That's, <laughs> that is the only television I watch. Well, I think you could have brought a little better luck to him on Sunday, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> um, uh, Your Honor, I just want to offer one thing. A, a note was passed that um, DIX uh, 1475 was not admitted into evidence. It was only judicially noticed. Well, there is a difference, but <clears throat> all right. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, 1475 was subject to judicial notice. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, in your experience, you think of a group of Americans that has faced stronger political opposition in recent years than the gay and lesbian community. No, I can't. Why is that? Uh, I believe it has been okay uh, to... Uh, discriminate against gays and lesbians. Uh, I think it's been okay to uh, not offer them the same rights and responsibilities until just very recently. Uh, I th still think people think it's okay for them uh, to judge that their relationships, uh, that their uh, love for each other is different, uh, is somehow less than uh, the love or the relationship that a heterosexual couple has. And I think that's most manifested most uh, prominently in the fact that they're not allowed to get married in the state of California. And I believe what's being said is we don't think uh, that you folks have the same type of relationship or that you love each other as much, so we're not going to allow you to be married. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nothing further, Your Honor. Well, thank you, Mr. Herrera, and I trust you will. Uh, Take your guidance. Those depositions, I noticed some of the same problems in this deposition of this witness. And <clears throat> I think your office needs a little um, counseling on that subject of how to defend and take that positions. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanders. You may step down. <coughs> and who's the next witness? I do. <clears throat> it's Lee Badgett. It's B A D G E T T. Lee L E E. Okay. Good morning, Professor Badgett. Um, we will as is the custom, have some binders to pass out to you and to the court. Um, but let me begin by just asking you some background questions. Um, where are you presently employed? I'm employed at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. What is your position there? I am both a professor of economics and I direct the Center for Public Policy and Administration. Uh, and do you have any other positions? I am also the research director of the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law. How long have you been the research director at the Williams Institute? 
Uh, it's been uh, about four years. And how long have you been at uh, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst? I've been there since 1997. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and I assume that you have a uh, bachelor's degree? I do have a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and a PhD in economics from uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Um, Your Honor, we have given um, counsel for the defendants a list of exhibits, um, which I would uh, at this time uh, offer unless there is some objection. And I do have an objection to some of these exhibits. Um, Can you identify the four or five <clears throat> so that we can then exclude those for the moment and <clears throat> take care of the rest of them? Yes, Your Honor. Hmm. PX Sorry, what was the? Read the last one, please. All right. Um, then a possible objection is noted as to those exhibits, and I gather. There is no objection as to the remainder that uh, Mr. Boyce intends to offer. Is that correct? Very well. Then, Mr. Boyce, if you would, if you'd be so good as to give the list of those exhibits that you're moving in to the clerk, with the, you'll note that with the exception of those referred to by Mr. Cooper, the remainder shall be admitted. If you can get some attention from your colleagues. <laughs> Perhaps this is a good time to take a break. <coughs> Why don't we take until uh, 25 after the hour? <coughs>